Hey Robot Makers, hope you're having a good day so far. So do you want to learn how to crack the Enigma code from World War II using some Python and a cluster of Raspberry Pis, however many Pis you have available on your network, then this is the show for you. So uh, let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin, come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole lot of fun along the way. Okay, let's get over to our keynote and um, ooh, have a... Not got it right at the very beginning there, so let's go back to there. There we go. So yes, this is all about uh, how to crack the Enigma code. So we're going to have some fun with some distributed um, Raspberry Pi Python. Uh, but before we do that, we're just going to have a quick word from our sponsor and then we'll get right straight to it, I promise. This video is sponsored by PCBWay, your ultimate destination for all things PCB manufacturing and assembly. Whether you're a hobbyist, a startup or a seasoned professional, PCBWay has got you covered. PCBWay offers an impressive range of services. They provide high quality custom designed printed circuit boards for any application you can imagine. From single layer to multi-layer, flexible and even rigid flex PCBs. They have the expertise to bring your designs to life. PCBWay ensures fast turnaround times and affordable prices without compromising on quality. With their state-of-the-art facilities and advanced manufacturing techniques, they can handle small prototype orders up to large-scale production runs with equal precision and efficiency. PCBWay offers additional value-added services such as PCB assembly, component sourcing and even functional testing. You can trust them to deliver the fully assembled and tested boards ready for integration into your projects. One of the best parts of PCBWay is their user-friendly online platform. It allows you to easily upload your designs, get instant quotes and track the progress of your orders in real time. Plus their dedicated customer support team are ready to assist you with any questions or concerns. So whether you're working on an innovative Internet of Things device, a robotics project or anything in between, PCBWay is your go-to partner for reliable and affordable PCB manufacturing and assembly. Head over to PCBWay.com today and turn your ideas into reality with PCBWay, your trusted PCB manufacturing and assembly partner. Okay, thanks again to PCBWay for sponsoring today's episode. Right, let's get straight to it, shall we? So, yes, we're going to be talking about encryption today, decryption and how to crack the Enigma code with a Raspberry Pi, a bunch of Raspberry Pis, in fact. So, very, very quick history of encryption. Honestly, we won't go over too much of this um, already. Um, so, one of the earliest methods of encryption was the Caesar cipher. Now, this was allegedly used by Juli Julius Caesar, I'm not sure that it actually was, but this is the one that's been attributed to, to him to sort of send secret messages. And it simply involves shifting the alphabet uh, by a number of different places and then using that, that letter, a bit like on this ring that you can see here. So in this case, if we have the message hello, we could then um, encrypt it as D-A-H-H-H-K. Uh, so the H is being replaced by the D and so on. Now, this is actually very easy to crack once you know that this is all it is because you've only got 26 combinations to go through so um, it's not very very secure but um, if you just had a cursory glance at it uh, you wouldn't really know what was being said there so it is something that uh, was used very very early on probably when people weren't particularly literate as well so that was way back when um, in the middle ages we had this um, visionaire cipher <laughs> to uh, go on to google to, to figure out how to pronounce that's a french name so the uh, visionaire cipher was a, a lot more complicated than the caesar cipher if, if effectively you have a number of caesar ciphers all lined up and you have a keyword and you simply repeat that keyword over and over and you use that same number of letters shifted uh, for each one of the letters that you want to encrypt so for example in this one if our keyword was frog uh, we would use the uh, we would re rotate our alphabet by five characters and then by whatever R is, number of characters, and then by O and so on. And then we would simply use each one of those um, to replace the characters um, in our actual message. So obviously the person receiving this has to know what the keyword is, but once they have that, they can, they can decrypt your messages. Now, transferring messages between people is always one of the challenges because... If you if you imagine you're this um, you're this king in this castle and you want to send a message to one of your um, concierges who might be in a tower hundreds of miles away and you don't want anybody to intercept this message, how would you tell him what that that message is? How could you deliver that message? And it's one of these kind of um, you remember that uh, that mind puzzle that they, you tend to learn in school about the uh, the chicken 
uh, it's the hen, the seed and the fox, and you've got to try and get them across a river. It's the same kind of thing. And what we need to do is figure out a way of getting a message from one place to another without it being intercepted in between. And it's, it's, it's difficult to do uh, for a number of different reasons. So one challenge that uh, was overcome by, I think, in this king and consort thing was uh, the king... Um, put a padlock on a chest and the message was inside the chest and the chest was very secure it's made of uh, the strongest material so they they were pretty sure that that wouldn't be able to be opened up that was sent across to the the conce uh, the 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 person at the other um the console at the other um in the tower hundreds of miles away he then attached his own padlock and sent it back uh, then the king received it unlocked his padlock it was still padlocked it went back with the um uh, the con <laughs> I keep getting that name mixed up um, with the uh, the person who's receiving the message they have their padlock on and when they received it they could unlock it and get the message but that requires a message going backwards and forwards several times and it's not exactly ideal if you want quite a, a quick message uh, being encoded and decoded so this visionaire one uh, is quite a nice one because you just need to have that keyword and maybe you could get that one through a trusted source uh, or maybe they, they could visit the castle, get the message, and then from there on, they could have that to, to decode it with. But that only works if uh, people don't know that one. So in World War II, there was this uh, Enigma machine that was uh, created by the, uh, the German army. And this was a very, very complex uh, sequence of encryptions, a bit like the Visionaire, but with many times over complexity. And we'll actually have a look at how it exactly does that. And it uses electrical pathways to encrypt the message. Uh, and it, there are astronomical numbers of possibilities of what the message could be encrypted. So it makes it very difficult to manually decrypt this. And they would change this every single day. Now, what they did have, so where we said before about having that frog or the, the sort of keyword, um, each one of the officers who would have one of the machines to send or uh, decrypt, so encrypting or decrypted could be done on the same device, but they would have to have a little book. So they would have like a little, imagine this is the uh, the code book, and each day would be um, a, a different code sequence that they would have to type in. So they, it, it wouldn't much type it in as you would set the machine up uh, with some rotor positions, um, a, a the initial position that these rotors are in and the plug board connections as well and we'll have a look at exactly what all those are in a, in a second so they would have that information and the books that they had so they had some of these in say the submarine and um, they were made of ink that would uh, dissolve if it came in contact with seawater so it, it wouldn't be of any use all you have to do if you are being captured is just make sure this gets submerged into water and then the enemy can't capture and have the uh, all the codes there because one they just need one book to be able to decode everything now what's really cool about this is this this guy here marion reduski he figured out without even seeing an enigma machine how it worked which is that's quite mind-blowing that he actually managed to do this with his team. So um, he instead relied on intercepted messages, some mathematical prowess, and um, the ingenuity of his uh, crypto, crypto analytic techniques. So he figured this out without even ever seeing an Enigma machine. Now, these Enigma machines were publicly available. You could buy one. The problem was having the codes and trying to decrypt it because just having the machine wasn't enough. You'd have to know what the rotor settings were, which rotors were being used, which reflector was being used we'll have a look at all these parts are in a second and also what the plug board combination is so even having a machine isn't good enough that doesn't tell you how to decrypt the messages and the number of permutations that you could go through to try and crack a message like i said is astronomical so this guy figured it out first and then building on that work alan turing at bletchley park he devised a machine that could decrypt this um, in, within a day so that they could actually and the idea would be they would receive an intercept in the morning using the latest day's um, encryption uh, settings. They could run it through this bomb, as they called it. We'll get on to why we think it's called a bomb <laughs> in a minute or two. And um, that would crunch through all the permutations. And when it found a match to a piece of text, so they would have a piece of text that they would call a crib. And a crib was basically like a short word like Hitler or Heil or submarine or British, something that they could use to search uh, to see if they got a match. Because without that, you could go right past the actual correct combination without knowing it so you need this little crib uh, this little piece of short text to do a match within the entire uh, possible messages that come through there 
So why is it called a bomb? Um, so that guy, um, Marion Reduski, we looked at previously, he made his own um, Enigma machine by hand uh, to try and figure out how he could possibly defeat the device. And he was trying to come up with what he could call it, so he called it a bomb. Um, so some people say that it's um, it stands for something, but there, there isn't actually a correct um, reason why it's called that, but he simply just called it a bomb. Maybe because he thought it looked like one, it looked like a very strange um, device on his desk there. So that name stuck and you can actually go and visit Bletchley Park in the UK just outside Milton Keynes. We did this uh, twice, uh, once last year and I think in 2017. And you can actually see the room where Alan Turing came up with all this. You can see the bomb reconstructed and it sort of whirs away. And you can see a lot of their Enigma machines as well. There's quite a lot of different varieties of Enigma machines. But that significantly meant that we could uh, we had victory in World War Two because we were able to crack those German codes and actually understand without them knowing that we knew what they knew. So th this is the number of permutations that you have to go through to crack uh, an Enigma. So the rotors, we're going to have a look at what these rotors are in a minute, but they're essentially a disc which has letters of the alphabet on. Inside there are some electrical connectors, but within the rotor um, you can you can have lots of different wiring. So a letter A coming in might go to a letter Z, for example, uh, coming out. On those different um, rotors, there's lots of different types, at least five different types of rotor, and you could have them in different orders, and you could have three uh, per machine, and then later I think they, they expanded it to four rotors per machine. So the number of possible rotor orderings, there's 60. The rotor position, so which positions are they going to be in? So you could actually turn the rotors and set them. So there's 17 and a half thousand different positions that those three rotors could be in. And then there is these plug board connectors. So you can you can then manually up to 10 different um, hand wired connections to again, just make a different letter go to a, a, another letter pair. So that ends up with this very long number. Um, you can see there it's just it's astronomical that's how many message encryption possibilities there are with enigma so to try and do that every single day go through that that's not possible by a team of people um, so they would have to come up with a method that could that could crack this that didn't involve people manually trying to work this out um, like a crossword puzzle so let's have a look at how this actually works we're going to look inside the enigma machine so we start out with the base this is the bottom of the machine it's sort of a little steel base there with a lots of different parts on it uh, we've got a, a battery pack so this is before the days of um, electrical uh, appliances being regular in in uh, offices and households you just had to have a, a battery probably like a 12 volt battery uh, we have a rocker so every time you hit a key on the keyboard um, that is a bit like um, hitting shift on a, a typewriter it would the entire carriage would would tilt and that would make this little rocker mechanism turn one of the rotors one um, one rotation round to the next letter so each time you press a key these rotors are turning and it's a bit like that uh, visionaire cipher with the uh, the keyword changing each time you press a new key and that's why it's even more complicated because um, if you pressed aaa you wouldn't get zzz out the other side you'd get some other letters as well so very very um complex mechanism there so that's the battery box and the rocker we've then got the rotors themselves so these are in this case we've got three rotors and that uh, larger thing on the side is the reflector so the power would come through the battery when you press a key you would you um, make a circuit and that would go through each one of the rotors in turn to the reflector and then back again through the rotors one more time and then to the plug board at the front so next up we've got this switch assembly so this is when you hit a key this is actually what makes the electrical con connection uh, and provides some power to the bulb above it as well we've got the keyboard looks a bit like a, an old-fashioned typewriter and weirdly they don't have a space bar on here so there is no space it's just 26 letters of the alphabet so instead of using space they often use the letter x to separate words because it's not very common uh, in the alphabet is in names but not in the alphabet then we've got the light board so when you press a, a key it makes all the electrical connections and a light will light up to tell you what the letter is that that's been encoded to so you would have somebody pressing the keys and somebody else next to them writing down what those um, encrypted letters were so it didn't have to be one pair so it tend to work in pairs and we've got the uh, the lid there as well and then the plug board at the very front, you can see that is the um, where you put these 10 cables in addition to um, if you wanted to. So you could, when you put the plug in, it would kind of short out um, 
the the combination that was already in place so you didn't have to use a plug board but you could use up to 10 different combinations of that as well and then we've got this nice oak case that the whole thing goes inside as well so uh, i found this cad model on uh, GrabCAD. i was absolutely blown away with the the detail of it so i was very impressed that they uh, made this available for free so this is where i got this from from GrabCAD. Okay, so the rotors themselves, you can see that this is a reflector D. I think we're going to be using reflector B in a lot of our code in a second. Now, within each one of these rotors, there's also a slip ring. And the slip ring enabled you to further scramble just by rotating. And it would just change the position of the, um, the, the letters inside and how they were scrambled. So they had different positions that that could be in. I think there's like five different positions that that slip ring could be in itself. Um, you can see there there's these little electrical connectors so there's one for each letter of the alphabet and they would touch to make the electrical connector so you could take these um, rotors out you could change the order that they're in and there's five uh, possible rotors that you can put in there one two three four five uh, but you could have them in like four three two or one five two whatever the different order you wanted to and there's a few different reflectors as well again just to scramble the order even further Okay, so this is how the encoding works. So you press the W key on the keyboard, that um, gets power from the battery, uh, and then the plug board will then convert that W to a U. The rotor one takes that U, changes it to an X. Rotor two takes that X, changes it to a G. The next one takes it from a G to an I. The reflector changes that I to a U. That U then becomes uh, an S on the ro rotor three, and so on back to the plug board, and that gives you this letter G. So W in this particular configuration gives you a G. Now, once you've pressed that key, it will change the order of all the, the rotors because of that uh, rocker mechanism, uh, and that again scrambles it. So each time, I think once rotor one's gone around 26 times, it then rotor two changes and so on. So um, you get a very different combination. And again, the plug board can further um, add some complexity to that just by those 10 different cables that you can put on the front there. So to be able to, to defeat this, we need to be able to test every single one of those permutations out with a piece of crib text. And that's what they managed to do in World War II. So if you like what I do and you want to make me more, if you want me to make more of these types of videos, please give this video a like. Drop me a comment. Let me know if you've got a cluster of Raspberry Pis. Um, that's something I'm interested to know if other people have these. Uh, and if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing. It costs nothing and it means a lot to me. It helps me grow the channel. And I do go live every single Sunday at 7 o'clock um, GMT. So if you want to catch me and say hello, then you can do that on the live stream. We have a Q&A at the end and a bit of a hangout after the main show. Okay, let's get to some code, shall we? So over here, I have a Visual Studio code. I'm just going to go sort of full screen with this. And we're going to do some, um, some live coding now to try and encrypt a message. So the first thing we're going to do is I've installed on uh, this computer. If I go down here, if I do pip install pi dash uh, enigma, uh, that will install the Enigma library. So I've got this installed on here already. So I'm going to say from um, enigma.machine and then I'm going to import Enigma machine. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up that machine with the different settings that we need. So machine is going to equal uh, Enigma machine dot from key sheet and then the key sheet that's that little book that they would have in their submarines or wherever that would tell them what the settings of the day are. So for today, we're going to have um, the rotor. The rotors are going to be, um, let's do this. So this is going to be IIVII. It's going to use rotator, uh, rotor two, rotor five, and rotor three in that sequence. Next, we're going to have the reflector. Oops, just type that wrong there, sorry. Next, we're going to have the reflector. That's going to be um, reflector B. Like I said, there's a few different types of reflector there. And then the ring settings, these are these slip rings. We can also provide what the slip ring settings are. And in this case, I'm just going to set them all to be one, um, just so that uh, it's nice and simple for us. And then the plug board, we can even provide what the plug board connectors are. So we have 10 connectors. So we have to say what pair of letters these, um, these match up. So A goes to V. B goes to S, C goes to G, D goes to L, F goes to U, H goes to Z, I goes to N, K goes to M, O goes to W, and R goes to X. Now, it doesn't have to have every single letter being plugged in. 
Uh, if you don't plug something in, it has a, a default setting on there. So that's our machine set up. Uh, we're now going to um, dis we want to basically rotate those rotors round uh, and this little window on top of the uh, Enigma and you can see what they're set to. So what we need to do is just set that display. So if we say machine dot set display and we set this to Q, J, F. So it's going to rotate them around so we can see Q, J and F in that order on the little window. And then we've got some plain text that we want to encrypt. So our plain text is going to be Cheltenham. So why do you think we would choose Cheltenham as our plain text? Let me know in the comments below. And then our cipher text, we're going to take that plain text and we're going to process it. So we say machine dot process text. And we put in our plain text like so. And then let's just print out what our cipher text is. Like so. Right, let's run this and see what we get. Oops, uh, it says I've got an error there. Let me just uh, bring this up so we can see what the message is. So it's the key sheet. I've probably missed out a comma just after that rotor's there. There we go. Let's try that again. Uh, so it doesn't know that type. Ah, that's because I put the comma in the wrong space there. Let's try that again. Okay, so the encrypted text is this FKFPQZYVON. So there we go. That's that's our encrypted message. We can send that to somebody and they will be able to decrypt that if they had the exact same rotor, reflector, ring and plug board settings. So I know that's the correct answer that we should get there. So we can move on to the next piece of code. So we're going to try and decrypt this now. So we're going to start off with that same block of text that we just created up there. So from Enigma machine, import Enigma. The machine is going to be set the same from that key sheet. So we're going to use the same rotors, uh, reflectors, ring and plug board settings. And now and also set the display to be that QJF as well. And this time we're going to say plain text equals. Let's just grab that um, text that we just decrypted down there. And we're going to say cipher text equals machine dot process text so it's the same function that we're using to encrypt or decrypt and that's one of the quirks of the enigma machine we'll talk about that in a second and then we're just going to print out what the plain text is that we get back right let's just run this and let's see what we get uh, so if i've done that right crypt text oh i typed that wrong so that should be the cipher text sorry and then the plain text should be like so. So there's the cipher text. And then we actually want to print out our plain text. Sorry about that. And we need to type in a cipher text as well there. Okay. So there we go. So it's decrypted it and it's returned it back to Cheltenham, which is the the word that we originally encrypted with those particular settings. So one of the weird things about the Enigma is each character, so an A character, will never be encoded as an A character. It will always be in character, it will always be encoded as a different character. And that means that um, we can use that in the mathematical crypto analysis um, of this. It's one of the weaknesses of the Enigma machine. It makes it half as effective as possibly it could be. Um, so there we go. That's the, the first um, encoding and decoding. So we're going to move on to now um, encoding a, a more World War II like um, a longer message. So let's go over to here. I've started out again with the the same thing here. We've got the the same settings. Just says be typing this out. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a function that's called pad string. We're going to have an input that we we put into this, and this is going to essentially um, space out at the end of our message. If it doesn't if it's not divisible by five, we can't send out um, letters in groups of five. So it just makes it easier if we put like a bunch of X's at the end of the message, whatever that might be. So this is what this function is going to do. So if we say padding needed equals oops, equals and then it's the five minus the length of the input. And then we want to then do a modulus of five. So do you know what modulus does? That will um, divide it without a remainder. So let's now do a padding string equals input plus X. And then we times that by the padding needed. 
like so. And then we're just going to return the padded string. Oops, padded string. There we go. So if we just uh, print out, um, let's just say padding pad string. If I say this is a message, and then I print with pad string. There we go. And then we just run that you'll see that it says this is a message XXX because it's padded the string so that it's divisible by five. That's all that that pad string does. We're gonna have another one which will uh, put some nice spaces in between. So I'm gonna call this one format for transmission. Now in reality, they if, if the um, the message didn't it wasn't divisible by five, they would just stop. This is just because it looks prettier for our code. So input string. And what we're gonna do here is um, a fancy function we're going to say return let's see if you can keep up with this this is a bit of an advanced python for you so we're going to say join together and then the input string and i am reading off a thing over here to the side just to make sure i get this right so i i plus five and then we say for i in range zero the length of the string which is the input string and then comma five so what this is going to do is it's going to format our message into blocks of five letters we can test this out uh, down here so let's do that so let's say um, print uh, format for transmission and then let's pass in this is a test Like so, let's just run this and see what happens. Um, so it's put it into blocks of, if we do a longer message, let's say, let's say that there was no spaces in this first of all. So this is a test. Let's do it the way that they would do it. They would have X's in between, there we go. So it's gonna put it into blocks of five, you can see there. Okay, so we would use this format for transmission along with the pad string so that we always have blocks of five letters at a time. Right, so let's have a, a plain text message now. Let's just get rid of that. Plain text equals, and let's say, uh, I need to have the, all this in capitals, so hey robot makers, this is a secret message. There we go. And but that we can then we're then going to do plain text equals plain text. And we're going to replace any spaces with an X, capital X, because again, the Enigma machine doesn't have spaces. Uh, let's just correct that typo there. Makers like so. And then let's pad the string. So plain text equals pad string. And then the plain text itself. And then the cipher text is going to become equal to the, the machine.process and then plain text oops and then finally we can use our format for um, transmission and we can put in the cipher text like so right let's run this uh, why is that not happy cipher text there we go let's run this and see what happens oops so process needs to have a process text I always think uh, auto completes and help me for that. There we go. So we've now got this sup, uh, sup GPYCV, blah, 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 blah. And that looks like what you would see on a, an intercept from one of the listening stations uh, at uh, station X. So that's uh, that's in, that's properly encrypted because I know we, we look at that in our next piece of code. So that's how we would um, format it for for transmission and we would send that out using some Morse code. Interestingly as well, the messages that were being um, intercepted were of course in German. So not only do they have to uh, decrypt the message, they also have to speak German and understand that they've got a, a message that has been um, encrypted properly. Uh, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna use, um, I've kind of put some of this together and I'll show you this what this means. You can see there that message, I've actually had this prepared so I know that that was the correct encryption there uh, we can get rid of that uh, cipher text there so we're going to import time I want to show you how fast this takes to do a brute force 
uh, decryption of a message. So this is what this uh, brute force code is going to do. It's going to try every single permutation out. Uh, and we're going to see how long it takes to do that. So because I, I'm suspecting that we might have the word robot in this piece of um, encrypted text. Um, so we're going to we're going to use the crib text of robot because I hope that that's going to be in there. Now, sometimes in the intercepts, they would try lots of different cribs. Hopefully they would find one of them. Things like weather was quite a common one or British might be in there um, or some slight some insult might be in there as well. So that's the crib text. The message is what we've uh, we've captured from our listening station. And then I've just created a um, dictionary there or list of all possible rotor positions. So one, two, three, one, two, four, one, two, five, and so on. So all the, uh, the, the different positions we can have. We're going to just try this plug board setting out. Um, we would have to try all the plug board settings and all the slip ring positions as well. Uh, but for this, just to make this um, workable in a show that's live, I'm just going to go with these ones to begin with. So that's just a bit of caveat there. Now we previously looked at uh, how to decrypt a message. This is exactly the same as what we've seen before. Um, all I'm putting in here is uh, uh, some parameters is the rotor choice, which is if we go up there, these different which which one of the five rotors we're using in what order. So it's just going to accept one of those uh, uh, keys like that. The start position is those three letters, which is what the rotors are starting from. And then there's the actual cipher text itself. So that's that's how we decrypt a message. Um, so that code there is pretty simple. We just set up the machine. We set the display to be the start position. We make the plain text um, get processed from the cipher text. And then we just replace any X's with spaces just to make it easier for us to read as people. Now, um, this find rotor position, we need to build this out. This is going to be doing the, the real work of the, uh, the this particular brute force thing. So we're going to say, we're going to do, I think is a weird thing. Within the function, we're going to do an include, uh, an import. So from uh, Enigma, oops, Enigma. You don't normally do this. You would normally have these at the top is the convention. So import, and I'll tell you why that is in a second. Import uh, Enigma machine. Um, I've done that wrong. So Enigma dot machine import Enigma. There we go. So the reason we're doing this is we're going to actually send this function off to our cluster, and it's going to take that and any imports that it requires, it's going to it's going to take them from this line. So that's why we actually do in here. We're actually going to send this function off to some remote machines. Um, so we're then also going to say the alphabet. So let's uh, hope that if I can type the word alphabet. Uh, let's see if we can get a uh, uh, co-pilot to help us with this because it'd be quite laborious to type this in. Anyway, it's not going to do that. F G H I J K L M N P Q R S T W X Y Z. Hopefully, I've not missed anything there. So we need that to be able to test every single permutation of uh, letter in our code. We're then going to set up our machine. So our machine equals um, Enigma machine. Um, from key sheet and we're just going to do the same thing we've done before so the rotors uh, equals a rotor choice that we passed in as a parameter we're going to set sorry that uh, auto completes get in the way there we're going to set our reflector to be our reflector we're going to go with b on this one again this is a bit of a cheat you would have to go through every single combination of those as well our ring setting is going to be equal to our slip ring. So uh, slip ring, which I think we've set to 111 at the top there. And what we're going to then have as well is the plug board settings. So plug board settings equal to, and we're going to put in plug board as well there. So plug board, that's also a, where do we put it at the top there? The plug boards and also a, a variable, a constant at the top there as well. Right, so that's going to set up our machine. Uh, and now what we need to do is we need to go through each one of the rotors and test out have we got the, the correct setting there. So for rotor one, let's create a variable called that in alphabet. For rotor two, in alphabet. And you've guessed it. For rotor three in alphabet, we're then going to we're going to work out what the start position is. So the start position is going to be rotor 
1 plus rotor 2 plus rotor 3. So that's going to be, we're going to test out each one of those and see if we get a, a correct result with that. So then we need to do machine.display set or set display is the start position. And then we're going to try and um, decrypt that. So we're going to say plain text equals and then machine.process text like we've done before to decrypt the message. So uh, that's the cipher text that we passed in as a parameter. Now we need to test, does our crib appear in that um, decrypted text? So plain, t uh, so we've done that one, sorry. So let's, just, let's actually just print out what we think that plain text is. And let's then also put in here, if the crib text that we passed in is in the plain text, then that means we've got a hit, we can say print valid settings found let's uh, do that and let's do an exclamation mark because that's great and a couple of stars just so this sticks out and then we are then going to say decrypt the message using our um, decrypt function I'm going to print out the rotor choices I'm going to the start position and also what the message itself is and then we're going to return all those so the rotor choice and the start position because we want those and if none of those things work if all fails we can basically just say um, return rotor choice and then cannot find settings okay So that's that. Let's have a look what else we've got. So on here then, I, I also want to um, replace. So message equals message. Not replace any of those spaces uh, with nothing. And that start time, let's uh, put a function in there, start time. Oh, sorry, I've already got that duplicated there. Right, so this start time and this end time, they're going to capture what the time was when we start the code running, and then when we've finished, it might be 14 seconds, I think it is around that kind of time, um, it's going to capture the end time, and then it's going to say what well, the duration is, end time minus start time, and then say the brute force attack completed in however many seconds. We're just going to round it up to one, one uh, decimal point. So this is running on a Mac M1. Uh, and if we've done everything correctly, let's see if we can run this. Now you can see that it's going through all the different permutations that are possible with the rote choice, with the plugboard settings that we provided, with the ring positions that we provided, uh, and also the, do we say the rotors that we've selected for this particular machine. So I think this takes around 14 seconds or thereabouts for this to go through everything on a uh, a Mac M1. If I type the code incorrectly, that of course, because if not, it'll keep going for a very long time. Now, if you've seen the movie um, with Benedict Cumberbatch in there, the um, what's it called? The initiation the initiation game. Thank you, Alex. Um, that was the name of a test that Alan Turing devised to try and figure out um, could a machine look like a person. So this imitation game was to try and figure out could you build an AI um, that would behave like a person. I don't think that's worked properly given the fact that it's still running. Oh no, there we go. So it, it's taken 53 seconds to find that answer. And you can see there the valid settings have been found. Hey Robot Makers, this is a t secret message. And the position is 253. The start position is QJF. And there we go, it finished in 53.6 seconds. That's quite a while for it to do it on even like a modern machine. And we're not even testing out all the different possible plug board settings or slip ring settings as well. So it takes quite a while, even on a very fast machine. So that's a brute force just using one machine. So what we're going to try next is doing some distributed code. This is what today is really all about. So we're going to use a, a function uh, of a library that's called dispy. Uh, distributed Python is how you would consider this. So let's uh, start out with some code to import dispy. Again, you'd have to do pip install dispy to get this uh, installed. So I've done that already. 
Now I'm going to say I've got some nodes. I've got this installed on eight Raspberry Pis um, just behind me that are flickering away. I think we can see them on the, the other camera that we can put on in a second. So this because this is running, they kind of advertise their, um, their ability to run code remotely. So if I say one dot star and then I do another one this this is the IP address of the machines or the range of IP addresses that's so that's uh, what one subnet and that's the other subnet oops there we go so the star just means all possible numbers between 0 and 254 I think that is right uh, we're gonna have a little function that we're gonna pass to our um, uh, our nose to actually run this one's gonna be a really really simple function it's simply just going to add a number to a number that's passed in uh, we don't want it to work too hard in this particular example so result equals num plus one and then return the result so that's all that's going to happen uh, and we'll talk through oops result there we go we'll talk through what's happening in a second we're now set up our cluster it couldn't be easier than this so cluster equals dispy dot job cluster and we pass in the function that we want to run which is called add number we pass in the nodes that we want to run this on. So uh, nodes equals nodes. And that's that little uh, range there. So we've not even provided specific IP addresses. It'll find them and it'll find them real quick. And we can even have a log level if we want as well. So we can just say dispy dot, um, dot logger uh, dot debug. I think that's right. Dispy dot logger. Just wonder why it, oh there we go got a typo this pi right okay so what we need to then do is just define a little dictionary or list of um, jobs it's got nothing at the moment and we're just gonna have a variable called id we're going to set that to one so for n in let's just give a range of numbers let's do one to a hundred so we want to run our add number a hundred times um, we're going to say job equals cluster oops dot submit we're going to pass in the value that we want to to run which is this add number it's going to receive whatever n currently is so it's going to go from 1 to 100 we then say job dot id equals id we're going to say job jobs dot append so that we've got a list of jobs that we can look at it's going to append job to that So why is it not? Oh, there we go. That should be jobs up there. That's our list. There we go. And we want to just increment ID. So ID equals ID plus one. Okay, so that's going to submit all the jobs. We then want to just have a little prompt that just says waiting for the jobs to complete. And we can just get to cluster.wait for that. So that will basically just wait until all the jobs have completed. And then we can go through each one of those jobs and... Uh, just get the status back so for job in jobs print and if we do a little f string we can say job and then job id and we can say result is and then job dot result so whatever that returns will be in job dot result right so let's run this and let's see what happens now so if i go there so it ran very very quickly let me just move this up a little bit so we can see here we've got a hundred jobs being submitted to our um, to our cluster of Raspberry Pis. So you can see there we've got all these messages saying receive job, running job, uh, and then receive results, and then the results come back. So for job forty one, the result was forty two because it added one to the number, and so on. Now that's actually run on a cluster of Raspberry Pis. We can actually, if we scroll up to the very top there. Um, oh, actually, we need, we need to do job.status for that. So let's just add a piece of code at the very end of that. Um, so let's say cluster.status. And let's do cluster.close as well. Let's run this again. And let's scroll up to the top. We should get like a nice little table that shows us what's going on. That's what I'm looking for. Um, I thought it was status. maybe it's print maybe that's what I've missed out cluster.status let's try that there we go we need to have a 
brackets on there and there we go has that done it no uh what is it called let me just have a sneaky peek at my other piece of code and i shall tell you what that is uh print status it's called so let's just do it's actually called cluster print status there we go that's what i'm trying to get you get this nice little table up there you go that shows you all the different nodes that it ran on so we can see there we've got eight different nodes of so dev one two three four nodes one two three four they've got four cpus each so that's uh what 16 possible uh, 32 possible cores is that uh, and then number of jobs that's been run on each of those nodes so interestingly that's got slightly less but the more powerful raspberry pi fives can run uh, a few more jobs like a third more jobs and the time it took for them to run on each node as well so we can see that it took 0 0.1 of a second to run 100 jobs to add 100 numbers together so we want to do this now but but instead of submitting that simple number thing we want to do the find rotor so that's what we want to do next to actually crack so if i go over to this last piece of code so this is the same as what we've seen before on our local brute force so we've got all the rotor settings there we've got our crib text as robot we've got the actual text that we want to decrypt we're going to replace the uh, any spaces in our in our text um, in these five groups just get rid of the spaces in there that's what that does our cipher text is going then going to equal that uh, process text our ring choice is going to be 111 and we've got that function there that's called decrypt message so that's going to decrypt our message and then we've got this find rotor start so we're going to pass in the rotor choice so which one of the rotor possible choices what's the ring choice what's the cipher text and what's the crib text um, so this is very similar to what we did it's exactly the same in fact of what we did before in our brute force locally but now we're adding to this the the node setup the creation of the cluster printing out that cluster status setting up our jobs like we did before and then collecting those results back so we're then going to say found equals false we don't know if you've found a, a match yet so we're going to go through each one of these um these jobs so if they've finished we can then make the rotor setting ring setting and position equal to what the current jobs results are um, if it isn't finished then we basically just say the job isn't finished um, and it could just fail that particular one if it is finished and uh, we've, we've run that uh, code we can that looks like a bit of a duplication of above to be honest so we We'll need to get rid of one of them we can then say if a start position was found uh, we're going to test for that so if the start position is not equal to cannot find settings then we found the setting and then we can decrypt what the message is using the road settings the start position and there's the cipher text and then we can print out what the actual message was um, using those settings otherwise if we haven't found it the attack was unsuccessful and we can print the status out and close the cluster right so how many seconds do we think it will take to crunch through this so let's run this and see what happens next so i'm just going to move this up a little bit uh, so 53 seconds is the the number to beat uh, because that's how long it took to to work through so let's go through here and it's found four possible robots pieces of text in there so let's see if i just uh if i just move me out the way for a second so you can see that that very top one the road positions there it says hey robot makers this is a secret message so it's actually decrypted it uh, but there's also three other pieces of text that contain the word robot uh, but they don't like valid messages so they would that was just um, because we're looking through so many permutations in there so we now know what the the correct rotor settings are for that day now let's see how quickly this actually executed so it executed in 12.1 seconds so running it on eight raspberry pis with four cores each is faster than running it on a mac m1 with how many cores this has is it four cores um, so it's much much faster using a bunch of raspberry pis so these dev ones they're all raspberry pi fives and the other ones are raspberry pi 4s just out of interest and i think one of them is like a one gig and the rest are four or two gig i think uh, whereas the raspberry pi 5s are all eight gig uh, of memory so you can see that it ran really really quick 12.8 seconds 12.1 seconds in fact uh, to to run that code so how cool is that uh, that's pretty cool that we can crack the enigma code very very quickly um, so if we added to that the plugboard settings the slip ring settings as well we'd get a much more accurate 
um, and the reflector settings as well. We get much more accurate um, decryption of the Enigma code. Now, what's really weird is if you take this piece of code and you run one of the original pieces of uh, Enigma code um, captured text, one of the intercepts, you can see some of the messages in German, like, you know, British column of British troops detected or something like that. It's quite creepy to see some of that. Um, and there's th at least three different um, versions of the Enigma machine as well. There's one for the Air Force, one for the um, the Army, and one for the Marines as well for the uh, for the Navy. Cool. Okay, let's get back to our keynote, and let's have a. So we've talked about that already. Yes, I do go live every single Sunday, seven o'clock GMT. Oh, that looks like um, the wrong thing I wanted to include in there. Let me just get rid of that. Sorry, I thought I had this uh, all set up. There we go. <laughs> so you can buy merch um, from the, our store. If you go to kezrobots.com slash merch, you can pick yourself up one of these amazing hats. We've got them in a few different colors. Uh, depending what time of year it is, you can have, have different hats. I wore one of these hats when I was um, on holiday in Italy. And there's uh, this table, the couple next to us. And um, I kept on uh, this... Um, guy's partner she kept sort of whispering something to him and she was like he's got a hat on and after we'd finished eating and everything and i think uh, jenny had gone um, to the loo or something like that away for a second the woman sort of uh, said do you work with robots because you've got this hat that says robot maker she says my husband here he works for um and then there's the name of the company which i can't remember um but it was essentially a very big robotics company so i was having a chat about that um I can't remember the name. It was a, a medical robot that he worked on. Da Vinci, I think it was called, something like that. So these hats are a talking point. <laughs> we do have a Discord channel as well. If you want to hang over, uh, head over to kezrobots.com slash Discord. That link is now working again. There was an issue with that uh, last week, I think, when um, somebody pointed out that I was, just, I was using a different version of um, um, the, the software that builds the website, and it clearly hadn't had that uh, little redirect in there for Discord. But that's all fixed now. You can head over to Discord, uh, get a link there. And I'm on social media as well, so if you want to see some behind-the-scenes stuff that I'm working on, have a look at some of the, the things that are on my desk, for example, then I post pictures of all those um, to different social media. So I'm on threads at kevmackley at threads.net. Um, I'm kevmackley6 on TikTok. Uh, I'm a kevmackley on Instagram. I'm at KevsMac on X and at KevsMac at Mastodon Social on Mastodon and KevsMac at BeastGuide.social on Blue Sky. So if you've not joined Blue Sky, I think that's now open to everyone. So check that out as well. And if you want to get your name in the end credits, you can do this by going to kezrobots.com slash coffee. Uh, and then you'll be able to get your name in the end credits like some people I'm going to show in a second. If you want to also help out the show, let me make sure these are all switched on now so we'll be able to see these. Um, we have super thanks for people who want to watch this on replay and hit the thanks button. If you want to uh, do a super chat, if you're watching this live, you can hit the the chat super chat button and get your name up in lights on the screen right now and if you hit the thank the join button on youtube on the player it's just down there somewhere next to the subscribe button then you can join the youtube membership program as well it all helps support the show as well so yes let's have a look at some of those supporters right now shall we so we have uh, people who bought coffees recently. So Nicholas Han, Wayne and Steve Robinson have all bought coffees recently. And we've got a new member in our Buy Me A Coffee membership. We've got Lee who joined uh, this this last week. So we've got uh, Alvaro Diaz Gutman as well. We've got Mary Louise Mayer, Jeff Johnson, Dean Corti, Marlene Brent, Tom Shemi and Steve Phillips. Hi to everybody that's on the stream right now. And then on the YouTube membership side, we've got uh, Dale from Hydro Robotics. We've got Bill Hoy, Warren Steele, Stephen Cross, uh, John Lamru, we have Jonathan R, Octrad39, Vince, Alistair Ware, um, did I say John Paul Jolly, Cassie from, um, from Cassie, I can't remember if you have a, your robotics channel yourself actually, but we've got Cassie up here there, we've got uh, Tinkering Rocks, JDM, Johnny Bates, Hands from Chair Lights, Michael, and of course we have Tom as well. So yes, that's uh, I think everything I wanted to cover off on the main part of the show today. So if you're watching this on replay, this is the part of the video where I shall say thank you so much for watching and I shall see you next time.